everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, and thank, uh, thanks, uh, special thanks to people uh, also that uh, came in person. Um, so I'm very happy to introduce Slavik Soleski from Cornell University, uh, who would uh, give a talk on closed groups generated by generic measure preserving automorphism. Th thank you for the invitation and uh, Anush and Marcin for making it happen. So the talk, so I want to talk about, I'll talk about, th there's a single, there's certain type interactions between ergodic theory and uh, descriptive set theory. And this is essentially one aspect of the descriptive set theory, which is the dynamics of large groups, Polish groups. So I'll, I'll tell you, I will, be, I will go very slow just to make sure that we are all on the same page. In the beginning, later it will get a little more technical, but at the beginning I, I, I would like to explain the background rather thoroughly. The very, very basic stuff uh, is uh, spaces on which, in which descriptive set theories live. So these are Polish spaces, uh, which are just separable, completely metrizable spaces and Polish groups. So these are groups that are topological groups, where the topology is uh, Polish topology. So, uh, of course, topological group means uh, multiplication is continuous, inverse continuous. And so these are, these will be the main objects that we'll talk about. Perfect. And Polish, Polish groups, special case of those are second countable locally compact groups. So these are groups that are classically studied. Uh, all second countable locally compact groups are Polish. Yes, please. What is completely metrizable? Uh, there, there is a metric that induces the topology and the metric is complete. Yeah, it's, the metric is not unique. So it's kind of an important point that we don't, uh, mm -hmm. so the metric can vary, but the, the space will stay the same. We are in the category of topological spaces. So it's just that the topology can be induced by a complete metri met mm -hmm. by a complete metric that's separable. Yeah, that's a good point. And uh, second count, so the second countable locally compact spaces, uh, locally co compact groups, they have a very important object on them, namely the Haar measure. So this is not available here at all. So if you have a Polish group on which you have a, a hard measure, it is a, or a, an invariant measure, it automatically is locally compact. So these, all these classical methods are not really available to us. So what uh, we have to, have to certain, have substitutes for those, and the substitutes will be uh, either combinatorics or topological methods coming from substitute using Set that I will introduce in a moment, meager sets uh, instead of measure zero sets. And uh, these meager sets are kind of quite nice, and I will say a little bit about them. So, uh, but okay, so a couple uh, more important basic notions for us. Borel measure, but Borel measure is defined on the sigma algebra. It's any measure that is defined on the sigma, sigma additive on the sigma algebra of Borel subsets of a Polish space. And now the ones that will be interesting to us for most of the talks, uh, talk are atomless. So no point is given weight, positive weight, and there will be probability measure most of the time. So such objects are all isomorphic actually to the Lebesgue measure on the interval zero one. So if this is a little too abstract thinking about the Borel measure, one can just think about the interval zero one and Lebesgue measure only, it's lambda. You know, at some point we'll have to go to measures that are finite, not necessarily probability measures and uh, it will be just convenient to have this, this relaxed, uh, relaxed class in mind, but for most of the talk, this is enough. Okay, so this is this. Now, the very important, I already kind of alluded to it, uh, the very important notion that substitutes for the notion of having measure zero is the notion of, of being meager. And now, uh, being a complement of a meager of a small meager set is called sometimes they are called co-meager or generic sets. So this is the notion of genericity I want to introduce. Again, it's it's very general. It 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 is applicable to in any Polish space. We we'll, we'll apply it only on groups, but uh, it's applicable on it's definable on any Polish space. And then so here how it goes. These are the small sets. So think of them topologically zero sets. So I said there's nowhere dense. I have to first say what nowhere dense are because meager sets are defined as countable union of nowhere dense sets. So that's simple enough. But uh, nowhere dense sets, uh, nowhere dense sets are. So what are sets that are nowhere dense? Are sets that are dense in no 
non-empty open set. So this means, this translates into saying that the closure of, of the set cannot contain any open non-empty set. So if I have a set whose closure has no, no, has no interior, uh, I will call such a set no dense. So no dense sets and then meager sets are defined in terms of those. The important point here is that if I have a, a meager subset of a Polish space is small. So in, uh, an indication of it is that its, it's complement, for example, is non-empty. In fact, it's dense always. So meager sets are always, are, so you, you say, okay, the complement is dense, that's not really so big, but notice that if I have a meager set, the complement, uh, I can keep, so I have one meager set, the complement is dense, I can add to my meager set more meager sets. The, as long as I add only countably many, the complement will stay there. So I cannot fill up the space with countably many meager sets, the complement will always stay dense. Stay, stay dense. So complement of a meager set is actually, it's, it's a substantial, topologically substantial subset of the space. So uh, now a linguistic convention is, I would say that the generic element of G has property P. If the set of elements that don't have property P, this exceptional set is meager, is small. Yeah, so I would say, uh, so there is no notion of being generic in this talk. I don't have any notion of being generic, but in the, in the, in the presence of another or some other property P of elements of the Polish space in question, I would say that a generic, uh, then, then, then I can say the generic set fulfills the, the P or fulfills its, its negation. Okay, so this is the smallness, the notion of smallness and the notion of genericity. That's kind of fundamental to what I would, I would talk about. So I should say that these meager sets are kind of, they, okay, they are topological, it's a topological notion. It kind of looks natural enough, but it has, on top of it, it has nice structural properties. So for example, a, a Fubini type theorem holds for it. So if I have a, there's a well-known Fubini theorem for measure, an analogous result is true for, for meager sets. So I will not go into it, Something uh, I will mention a Fubini type result in, a, in uh, later on, but it's, it's important to, to know that these are not, this is a structurally nice notion of, of smallness. Okay, so this is genericity. And now uh, the main group here, so the, the, the group of measure preserving transformation. So this is the group, I will call it odd. So what's the group? That's the main group for the talk. So this is the Polish group of all Lebesgue measure preserving transformations of zero one. So I have, I will take, I will start with a bijection of the interval zero one. And I want this bijection to preserve the Lebesgue measure. And then I will not actually take bijections, but I will, I will make, if two bijections of this sort coincide on a set of full measure, I will say it's the same element of odd. So I, odd really consists of equivalence classes of such transformations. So uh, these are equivalence classes. So that's my group. Uh, is the, uh, group operation is composition, as you would expect. Now there is a topology. I say it's here is a Polish group. So I have to have a topology on it. The topology, there's, it's, it's a standard topology on a group like this. It's called the weak topology. And uh, this, uh, the topology, let me not give the definition. It's very easy to give, but let me not do that. Let me just say that a sequence Tn of transformations converges to T with N. What, when does this happen? It's actually quite natural. You, have, you take Tn, you look at, at a measurable set, you apply Tn to it, then you do the same with, with T. Then you take the symmetric difference, and then you take the measurement of that symmetric difference, and then you require that it goes to zero with N for all a measurable. So this is this is my main group. One checks. There's of course I, I hear uh, I'm not checking many things, but these are standard things that this is a Polish group. So multi, it's a, the, this topology here is given by a separable, completely metrized, um, complete metric, and it is a group topology. These are not difficult to check, but I won't do it. It's so this is a classically studied group in ergodic theories. Ergodic theories are concerned with elements of that group. Uh, especially if they are ergodic <laughs> automorphisms, and uh, uh, not just elements of this group, but, but the structure of the group. So not just single elements, but also the structure of the group itself, the structure of subsets of the group and so forth. So for example, there are classical results here. Maybe I should 
Aha, I, for, yes, this is I already said that. So a classical one, just to connect this group with the notion of genericity, the classical results by, uh, this is probably Hal Rochlin or Halmosh, let's say that the generic element of that group is ergodic. In fact, a generic element of this group is weakly mixing. So this is standard notion of kind of high level of ergodicity. So uh, on the other hand, there is, there is a result of that if you have a strongly mixing, the, the elements, a generic element is not strongly mixing. So it's weakly mixing, but not strongly mixing. So there, are, there is connections, are classical connections from the 30s or 40s that, uh, that connecting that, that group, the fact that there's a Polish group and the notion of a, a, a genericity and various versions of ergodicity. Okay, so what is actually the subject matter of this talk? So I will look at, so this is a general definition. We'll mostly talk, but not exclusively, about this notion on the group, on the group from the previous slide, but let me introduce the general notion. So for a Polish group G and an element G, I, I do the following thing. I first, I first, so I first look at the group generated by the, the single element G. So I look at all integer powers of the G. And then I make some uniformizing. So I take the closure. This closure is still a group. So a closure of a, so I have, I take this closure in a Polish group. So this closure, there is a topology with respect to which I, I, I do that. It comes from G. And the closure of any group is still a group. So this, this closure is still a group. And uh, now it's a closed subgroup of G. So if G were, is Polish, this being a closed subgroup, it is itself a Polish group. Uh, and there is some ad additional structural properties of that group. Uh, notice that the group generated by just by the Gs, this group is abelian. I mean, it's just either a cyclic group or uh, isomorphic to Z. So if I take its closure, it's still an abelian group. But one can, by against some older results, for uh, at least for so. Maybe I, I let me let me hold on to hold off this this remark for a moment. So uh, so we will what we will actually talk about is this group this group ought, and I will look at groups this closed group generated by single element of ought, and it is so these are closed co closed uh, abelian subgroups of ought. It is it's a classical result that says that for a generic T this this group is actually uncountable. So even though the group of which I'm taking closure is a countable group. It's, it's Z or a cyclic group. These groups are usually, are, are most of the time uncountable. Yes, so my main point here will be, my main aim is to analyze groups of this sort for a generic T. So I want people to look at say some property P of transformations. And they ask, is it the case that that of, of, of groups of this sort, is it the case that the group of this sort has property T for most T's, for, for a generic T? So these are the questions I want to ask here, right? What is the behavior of these groups for, for generic T? So I should say that in this, this is connected with another subject that is dear to, uh, to descriptive set theories, namely equivalence relations. So one, the, there is an equivalent, natural equivalence relation of isomorphism. If I have T1 and T2 in my group odd, so I have T1, T2 here, and I can, I make them equivalent if they are isomorphic. The notion of isomorphism here is that of conjugation. So this is one equivalence relation that one can look at. This equivalence relation, so this is an equivalence relation on odd. This, uh, there's many results that testify to a very, so initially von Neumann in long time ago had this dream that one will be able to classify elements of odd, uh, equivalence classes of, of this equivalization on odd. One will say, be able to find some invariants, a such invariants to elements of the automorphism group that will classify uh, elements of odd up to this equivalence relation. This dream turned out to be very far from reality. And now there's many results that testify to, a, to a, a very erratic behavior of that equivalence relation. Now, what I'm doing here, in fact, is considering a different equivalence relation. So this is what ergodic theorists, uh, this was another program in ergodic theory, where instead of this, 
I make these two T1 and T2 equivalent if the closed groups generated by the T1 and T2 are equal. So notice if I have that, sorry, isomorphic, isomorphic, S, uh, topo S topological groups. If, if I have this equivalent, T1 and T2 are related in this way, there is an immediate isomorphism between the same conjugation gives me an isomorphism between these. But if I just require these two groups to be isomorphic, it's very far from, I'm much more liberal, I'm much more generous, very far from T1 and T2 being uh, conjugate to each other. In fact, this isomorphism is group isomorphism, that is a homeomorphism between these groups. We don't require that T1 be mapped to T2 at all. T1 may be mapped, mapped to some other place in that group here on the other side. So this is much more generous. And then the hope, this, the next hope was that perhaps this equivalence relation behaves in a much nicer way than this one. It is much more generous, has, a, has bigger equivalence classes. And the hope even was, that uh, this equivalence relation will have a generic equivalence class in the sense that there will be a single class of that equivalence relation that is, that, is, that is a generic set. So a generic T will belong to a single equivalence class. This would mean if I take two generic T1 and T2, these groups are actually isomorphic to each other. So within that equivalence class, all these groups are isomorphic to each other. So there's a single group that all of them generate. There is a, a Comiger set such that elements of that, that set generate a single group as a closed, as a closed, generate a single closed group. And so that was kind of the next phase of the dream. And then uh, the main question will have, will have to do with that, uh, with, with kind of looking for a, for a generic equivalence class. Okay, but let me, let me first say a little bit so I hope we know where the aim is. So now the Boolean actions, uh, this is an important, uh, this, at this point is just, a, just an aside, but it's an important notion what follows. If I have a Polish group, a Boolean action of, of G is, is just a continuous uh, homomorphism from G to odd. So it's really a representation of G into, in odd. The word action is justified by the fact that G acts, G, G, so, it acts on, say, measurable subsets of zero one. Namely, if I have an, a, a set B and I want to act by G on B, what I do, I take zeta and I look at the image of G in odd, and then I can apply it pointwise to B. And this will produce another set. So this is the set that, is, that results from applying G to B. That's what I, how I think about these things. Notice that this is not really sets, but measure classes of sets because zeta of G doesn't really see sets of measure zero. Uh, an important point about this is that Boolean actions of this sort, you might think that actually, if I have a Boolean action of this sort, Boolean action on measurable subsets of zero one, it will come from point action on the interval zero one. There will be an action of G on points of the interval zero one, so that G on B is just the image of G under the, this point action. But that's very much, that's very much far from the truth. It's, it is true if the group is second count or locally compact, but if the groups gets larger, the groups are Polish, not locally compact, this will be false. There will be no point action. So we we'll have, have many situations, uh, and this is a subtlety one should kind of pay attention to. There will be many situations in which the group is not locally compact, will have a Boolean action. There is no chance of point realizing. So these are important actions here. Uh, an example here is, seems trivial, but it will, it will come up late in a moment. So it's, if I have a, an element T of odd, and I look at the closed group of T, this, this is generated by T, it's a subgroup of odd. It's actually a Polish subgroup in its own right, because it's a, it's a group in its own right. It's a subgroup of odd, so there is identity, an embedding of, of this group into odd. So it's a Boolean action. The identity is the homomorphism. So these groups have their own Boolean actions. Each group generated by, closed group generated by T has its own Boolean action. It's, that's something that's, to keep in mind. Now, two more groups, two more Polish groups, both of them highly, so this group odd is highly non-locally compact. It's not, not even close to be locally compact, but there's two more groups, very important one here in the, in the question that I will consider is the group I call L1. 
It's the Polish group of all classes of measurable functions from zero one to the unit circle. So I look at all measurable set, uh, measurable functions from the zero one to the unit circle. Yes, and I can multi, I can, this is a group because I can, if I have two such functions, I can multiply them point-wise. And there is a natural topology on such a group, namely it's a topology of convergence in measure. So this is in this case, because this, uh, the space, uh, the target space is bounded, all the LP except for P equal infinity topologies are, are the same on the group. So it doesn't matter so much that it is convergence in measure, but this is the right topology here. When, especially when I want to generalize it to other group rather, other than the circle. Right, so I have convergence in measure is simply seek a sequence fn converges to f. If for every epsilon, if I look at the set where f and fn are farther apart, all the points at which they are farther apart than epsilon, this set has to be as small as I wish. So as n goes bigger, this set goes, its measure goes to zero. Right, so con standard convergence in measure. Right, so this is a, a Polish group. Again, once checks that it's easy to check. It's an abelian group, a abelian Polish group, also highly non-locally compact. Any questions? This is the, okay. And then the last one, the very important in general, is the unitary group. One takes the Hilbert space. I will to fix attention. We'll take infinite dimensional complex Hilbert space. I look at unitary transformations of that H, so uh, bijections of H that are unitary. And again, I will take it with composition and I'll take it with the standard topology there, strong operator topology. Let me not go into it. These topologies are important to know that they exist, but because I won't be doing any proofs, it won't matter so much that what the definition is. Enough to say that they are canonical topologies on all these groups. All these groups come with these topologies. If you look at them, that's the topology we put on them. So this one has also a Polish, this is a Polish group topology on you. So I have, we have these three groups. Ot is the main ot, uh, actor here, and L zero comes into the uh, the main question that I will talk about. And this U is actually a very important group in its own right, but it will play here an auxiliary role, important in proofs. So there are these three groups: uh, Polish non-locally compact groups. Okay, very good. So now the question and the theorem. So we have all the all the definitions. So any questions about the definition or anything like that? Okay, so the question and the theorem. Uh, so th what's the question? So recall that, uh, re recall this, this main definition. I look at an automorphism and I want to study the group that is the closure, the closed group generated by T. And now the question was, it was asked by Glasner and Weiss. This has to do with the second, second dream here with the second dream. Yep. Uh, they ask, is it the case that for a generic T, this closed group generated by T is actually isomorphic to L0? Not just as a group, but as a topological group, right? TC has a topology inherited from odd. It's a Polish topology. L0 has its Polish topology. Is there a bijection between these two groups that is a group isomorphism and is a homeomorphism? That's what they are asking about. It looks like it's a very strong question, but that was, if you think about this, uh, if there is a generic class here in that equivalence relation that I mentioned, if there is a, a generic class, there has to be a group, a Polish group to which all these T's from the generic class, uh, such that for all these T's from the generic class, these group are isomorphic to that particular group. And their guess was that it is L0, that it's likely to be L0. And there is good, it, of course, this is rewriting the history. Nobody was thinking about these equivalent relations. It's just that thinking about the group odd and looking at properties of generic T, of a generic T, L0 was a natural candidate for that, in that question, natural candidate for this TC. Yeah. So I guess the point is we don't know many uh, natural topologically one generated uh, billion uh, non-locally compact Polish groups. Right? It's, it's, so it's a little more than that. I mean, this is kind of the, the main, right. the first step. I will justify that. I will justify why this question makes sense. This looks like a very strong question. Why would you think that generically something as uniform will happen? But there were good reasons to believe it. So this is what Anus is hinting at, but this would be the first point. So what were the reasons hope? Why, why would one hope for that question to have a positive answer? 
Oh, oh actually, oh, I, I see. I had it on the slide and then I thought I removed that slide and I, I this is what's on the blackboard there. I, 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 this, is, this is the stuff about this equivalence relation. I don't have to say that. Okay, so yes, yeah, so hope is that there is this generic class and what is the motivation? So that was the hope that there is this one class and everybody there generates the same group and that the, that group is L0. But why would it be L0? So first of all, L0 qualifies in the sense that this L0 is monothetic. In this, so mo by monothetic, they mean there is a single element of L0, actually many, there is a, but there is a single element such that if you look at the group generated by that single element, it's dense in L0. So it's topologically generated as a topological group by one element. So it's monothetic. Note, notice this group T, these groups TC are clearly monothetic. There is, a, I just take an element and generate a group by it. So at least this L0 qualifies. It's of the right kind. It's, uh, so it's not just, not just abelian, right? But it's generated yeah, yeah. By, by one. It is a set of, of uh, such elements uh, which generate L0. Generate. Yes. Yes, 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 correct. This is, yeah. It's so, uh, in fact, I said it's many, but it's actually an overwhelming majority. Your guess is correct. Over may, overwhelming majority of elements of L0 generate L0 topologically. It's a generic set, yeah. And then the second thing was by analogy. So there is, there is a, a Mellere and Sankov, for example, proved that in that group U, in the, in the unitary group, an analogous question has a positive answer. So if you take a generic uh, unitary, then, uh, then the group closed group generated by that, that unitary is actually isomorphic to L0. And the unitary group is related to odd. There is a canonical embedding of odd into U, and there is also a canonical embedding of U into odd. So this, this is a, a, this was a good analogy, but one has to say in all honesty, U is much more, much easier to work with. I mean, you have these big matrices, there's things to, you can move things around much more freely. So when one analyzed that question, there was not, it was a good thing. I was in the camp that it is L0, that the answer was yes for a while to that, to this question about odd. And this was like a good indication, but it was clear that the method, one will not just take the method and somehow modify it to work for all. This it looks like it's, it's much more difficult for us. Okay, so now the structure. Uh, these groups TC for a generic T each, so again, if this is the first result in a series of results proved by, it was a Russian school of energetic theory. There were several results proved along these lines. This is the first one by Agyeyev for a generic T, each abelian, finite abelian group embeds into TC. So for a generic T. So for a generic T, this TC contains every finite abelian group. And in fact, much more. And in fact, much more. So this was proved later on. So this uh, L0 has that property very easily. L0 has lots of toruses inside. So every finite abelian group is a subgroup of L0. So if TC is L0, that's automatic. Yeah. Another dynamic reason was Glasner and Weiss proved that for a generic T, the natural Boolean action of T is what they called whirly. So this is a notion of, this is a notion of, it's a very strong ergodicic notion, kind of a weak mixing for large groups, for Polish groups. And so in particular, this action of TC, this natural Boolean action does not have, is, doesn't come from a point action of TC. There is no point act generically, this TC does not act on points. Uh, so this was proved by Glasner and Weiss. And again, this is known abstractly for L0. Every ergodic action, Boolean action of L0 is whirly, kind of from general principles. So if TC were L0, this would be automatic again. So there were many kind of there was structure, dynamics, there was analogy. Uh, the reasons for believing it. There's one property of generic of T's that is kind of conspicuously missing here. And this, these are spectral properties of T. There was no connection between, and people studied spectral properties of a generic T. There was no connection between the spectral properties of T and the, the closed properties of the closed group generated by C. So this is missing. It doesn't mean it doesn't fit the picture, just there is no connection, which was somewhat suspicious. And this will be the key. So the answer, however, so there were all these positive 
things, but the answer turned out to be that the, it is not. So for a generic transformation T, the group TC is not isomorphic to L3. So even though there are all these indications, and I just gave a few indications, there's more theorems around, around this kind of positive result, but uh, the, the group TC is not isomorphic to L0. So this, if you, if you want to prove this, this, is, this opens the door, if you start suspecting that, opens the door for descriptive set theories, because if you want to prove that TC is isomorphic to L0, that's essentially you think all the hard work will be in, in ergodic theory. You actually, L0, you essentially would only use the definition. You've just somehow produced this isomorphism. But if it is not L0, how do you do it? So it will be half of the action is studying the, the automorphism group. You have to know something about this TC, but the other half of the action will be in just abstractly studying L0. How does L0 act? And this is what descriptive set theories do. They, they look at groups, these non-locally compact groups and study their action, their dynamics. And then you have to hope to find a mismatch between what you know about L0 and what you want about TC. And this mix, mismatch will, be, will have to do with spectral properties. So the, what is the rough outline? So this is the main theorem. And now I'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, its proof. Okay, so the proof will, will have two points. So uh, let me just say it like this. So first of all, if, if that were to happen, L0, I, topologically, as a topological group isomorphic to C, TC for a generic T, then the first point would be proving that there is some Boolean action of L0, there is one at least, with, which has spectral properties, properties similar to spectral properties of, the, of a generic. And so I have to, the thing is, I, I sum, this is, we'll have to construct that, it will be, have, will be a construction like this. And then the second conceptual thing will be to explain what are spectral properties of L0 not clear at all at this stage and what it means to be similar not clear at all so conceptually this is the conceptually the difficulties are here but then technically it turned out that difficulties will lie here one have to show that so that there is an action whose spectral properties are similar to spectral properties of a generic t and second point will be that no ergodic boolean action of l0 has spectral properties similar to spectral properties of a generic t and there is a clear contradiction between one and two and we are done there's it, this assumption in one couldn't have been true okay so that's that's the aim and then i have to explain now what are the spectral properties of l0 what's the similarity and maybe a little bit about how how this proof two goes of two goals. So this spectral behavior, and I'll take, I'll talk about spectral behavior first of a generic T. This is a, an area that was studied quite in, in extensively by ergodic theorists. And then I have to talk about L0. Okay, so the following thing, these theorems are, uh, so I, I will, I, please look, and my paper is on my webpage on the archive. So you can get, I don't want to be super technical about stating these theorems because uh, and they're kind of long, but I will say the main, the main idea uh, kind of behind each, each theorem will be stated on the slides. So there, is a, there was a work done by Choksin, Atkarni, Katog, and Stepin, and then the, the last result was proved by Delhunko Le Meintrich uh, in 92. They proved the following thing. So with every generic T or, or any automorphism T, one can associate a, uh, it's, it's, it's maximal spectral type. So each, for each automorphism, T on a, just a, an abstract uh, measure space, with each I, such T, I can associate actually a sequence uh, of measures on the circle. So with each T, I associate what they call spectral measure, a, a sequence of measures on the circle. The sequence of measures will be decreasing with respect to absolute continuity. So the next one is absolutely continuous with the, with the previous one. There is a sequence and they completely determine kind of behavior of T, a unitary behavior of, of T. So uh, what, I, what, what they do here, ah, and then the most important of these measures is the first one. And the transformation T doesn't actually determine the measures, but determines their types. By this, I mean it determines the measure up to mutual absolute continuity. So it's, if, I, if I have another measure that has 
is absolutely continuous with the one that is here, and this one is absolutely continuous with respect to that one, I can substitute one for the other one. So, and then, so now I have the sequence of measure types, and the main one is the top one, and this is called the maximal spectral type. This is this measure class of this top measure associated with a, a transformation T. This measure lives on a very simple space on the circle. So I don't want to go into what it is, but there is this association. And then their condition says that for a generic T, what I do is take, take T, take its powers. These are still transformations. Look at these maximal spectral types. So and I, ha I have, I vary these maximal, I look at various spectral types of powers of T. And then there is a very strong orthogonality conditions of convolutions for convolutions of these spectral types. If I take one sequence of powers, I take convolutions of this nu of TL, well, L is one of those finite sequence of powers I picked here, and I take another sequence of powers, and I do the same, convolute those uh, maximal spectral types of the, of the powers. As if these sequences were not, one was not a permutation of the other, these convolutions are orthogonal to each other. So one, they live on this joint Borel set, subset of S1. So there is this strong orthogonality condition of, of maximal spectral types of powers of T. So this is, there's, there's a, an operation on, semi-group operation on measures. If measures live on a group, one can, one can convolute to, to, such, to such measures. And S1, yes, S1 is a group, so this, this can be done. So now, the, 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 and the, when you say sequences, forward, you just mean tuples, right? Finite, finite, sequences, finite sequences, yes. finite sequences of powers. One mm -hmm. sequence, another sequence, and the, as long as this sequence is not a permutation of that one, the measures that are are produced here are orthogonal to each other. So, in particular, this, two different powers. Uh, two different powers, in particular, yes. So this is a, this is kind of if you think about it. If a generic behavior is often like this, that, that whatever you produce, there's like independence. I mean, you do something and then you do, if you, as long as you do something else, the results will have nothing to do with each other. So this is kind of expected, but it's not a simple theorem to prove, right? It's, it's, it's a substantial theorem. Okay, so in any case, that's one. And then, uh, so I will call this condition the the Hunkole Meinchuk orthogonality condition. Now, what is spectral behavior of L0? So now I, I, I have to define. So what, what do I actually mean even uh, by that? I, will want, I want to find a classification of unitary representations of L0. So what I, I mean by that is uh, I want to go and study continuous homomorphisms from L0 to the unitary groups. That's the object. And then, okay, so what are the ones that are, can e I can easily I can easily easily define these are look there is a very simple one I take I take phi is an element of L0 L0 of what there is a L0 of lambda s1 so lambda it's on the interval 0 1 there is measure lambda there so what I can do I can consider L2 of lambda L2 with complex values so this is a Hilbert space L2 lambda c C is complex, right? What I can do is take an F in L2 and just, if I hold phi in my hand, I take F and I just multiply it by phi. This produces another element of L2. So I just act it by phi on the Hilbert space L2. So, and if you check, it's easy to check. This is a unitary operator. So with every phi, this association F goes to phi times F is a unitary operator. So with every element of a zero, I associated a unitary operator and it's a homomorphism, easy to see. That's, this is a very simple minded guess of what, uh, what representations of a zero are. Now, okay, now you can, if you have that, you immediately see that you really didn't have to take L, L2 of lambda. You can go down to any absolutely continuous mu with respect to lambda and just do the, the same formula for uh, L2 of mu, and it still works. So you have more representations because you take change lambda to mu. Well, okay, and then you take, not only you realize that you don't have to multiply by phi, you can fix a power k, an integer power, and multiply by phi to the power k. These are still still a unitary representation. 
And then you think, okay, maybe that's all, but it's clearly not all, because what I can do is I can take not the interval zero one, but I can take and take, for example, the square and have one, so zero one, zero one. I can put a measure here on the square mu, and I can, you see, I have powers there. So I have a measure and a power. So here I will have two powers, K1 and K2 on these two uh, axes. And then I will, I will act on L2 of mu by phi. So where does phi comes from? I will take this phi here in L0 and the same phi here in L0. What will I do? I will take a function F in L2 of mu and I want to act on it by this phi. How will I do it? I take the projection down, pull back phi by that projection, raise it to power k1, do the same here, projection, pull back phi, raise it to the power k2, multiply the two functions that I got, namely pulled back phi to the power k1 times pull back phi to the power k2, and multiply f in L2 of mu by that product. And it's still, as long as the marginals of mu are absolutely continuous with respect to lambda, this still works as a, as a unitary representation. And now I've, if I did it in two dimensions, I can do it in three dimensions and arbitrary finite dimensions. So one can form a multi-dimensional version of the above unitary representation. What is it determined by? Finite Borel measure on the cube. Uh, whose marginals, the projections, are a continuous, absolutely continuous with respect to lambda, and then an assignment of powers. To each, to each axis, I assign the power. That is an integer. I, I will skip zero integers. If you think about it, they do nothing. They just multiply, don't really do anything. They just leave f alone. So these ki's will be positive, non-zero. Non, non so every, I have these representations. I will call them atomic, atomic representations that are of that form. So this is a class of representations of a zero. It turns out that an arbitrary unitary representation is built of such blocks. So let me maybe say first how to organize a sequence of such atomic representations. So let's look at Z minus zero. So I'm, again, I'm describing the arbitrary representation of L0, spectral behavior of the L0. The theorem that will follow essentially can be called spectral theorem for L0. So what I'm doing here is this. I will encode my atomic representation by a function whose domain is finite and domain is non-zero integers. Its range is, is natural numbers. How do I do it? If I have, so if I have Z here with zero removed, I have a finite domain and a function above it. And the, what, what will happen is I will look at the subgraph of that function. This will encode for me the powers. We, so you remember these representations, there is a measure to it and the sequence of powers. This will tell me what powers show up. Namely, if I have a K, say K1 in the domain, this power shows up. And if I have some K2, this power shows up also. So what's above that power? So what's the value of that function? Uh, it's the multiplicity with which that power shows up. So it turns out that there is a difference in this, this whole business. If, if two axes are assigned the same power, they are kind of indistinguishable. So this measure that I, I had there, this measure mu, it has to, has to be made symmetric with respect to flipping of these two, two, uh, two axes. So I want to keep track of that this axis, uh, these many axes come with that power. But if powers are different, I keep track. I, I, it's a different way of keeping track of them. So K, K1 here, K2 here, what's above K1 is the number with the multiplicity of K1. Okay. And then, so this is what I was talking about. So one, the, one looks at the subgraph X and one looks at the subgraph. This keeps track on about, uh, of the space on which mu lives, over which we take L2, on which we act by L0. And so actually the space is zero one to D of X. Notice that every element of the subgraph has its own axis. So that's why I take zero one to that power, to every element, to, the, to all this, to the subgraph. 
Okay, and then what do I do if I have such an X and such a such a cube D of X? I say that the measure that is compatible with X, if what I had on the picture, the marginals when I project mu on all the axes are absolutely continuous with respect to lambda. And there's two other conditions. I want they are easy, but I don't want to spell them out. There's some symmetry condition if the powers are the same associated with the two axes, and diagonals have to have measure zero. This is in order to get uniqueness. Not so important here. So, and then <clears throat> notice that an element X like this and the measure com compatible with that X completely determine an atomic representation of L0 on L2 of mu, just like I described it on this square here. So in any case, there is an X and there is a mu associated with X compatible. They determine a representation. That's all that one needs to remember. So now fix a unitary representation non-trivial, so no non-zero fixed points, fixed vectors. And then it turns out that any such C is built from atomic representation, representations determined by X and mu X as X ranges over these finite functions. So uh, no matter how complicated representation you take, you can build it as essentially L2 sum. I don't want to go, it's very, the simplest possible way from these atomic representations. And in fact, the sequence is unique up to mutual absolute continuity. So it's very much like in the spectral theorem. So arbitrary representation is determined by the sequence of measures indexed by this finite function. So that's the spectral behavior. That's what I mean by the spectral behavior of L0. And the above is true modular multiplicity. So let me not go into it. It's, it's, it's not really a single measure. It's a sequence of measures that decrease. Doesn't matter here. It's the main, the main, the main measure is there. Okay, so this is the spectral behavior of a zero. That's what I mean by that. Okay, so now what's the connection? So this is the first step. What's the connection with now this spectral behavior of T, of, of a generic T? So now it's easy to see that this N0, this, 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 this uh, family of finite functions comes equipped with coordinate addition. If I have two functions, I can add them coordinate wise. They have values in N, no problem with adding. If, they're, if their domains don't, don't completely coincide, I add them on the common part of the domains. And outside of this common part, I leave the function alone that is, so if I have a point in one domain only, I just leave the value alone, don't do anything to it. So I can add those. And notice that, that D of X plus Y, so, this D of X plus Y, when I add it, the subgraph of X plus Y is the union of subgraphs of X union subgraph of Y. That's, this is what, what's happening there. So in fact, I have this, the product D of X plus Y is equal to, this, sorry, this cube is equal to the product D, uh, 0, 1 to DX, 0, 1 to DY. And then because of it, if I have a, a compatible measure on on the first cube, on this cube, and the compatible measure on the second cube, I can essentially form its product. It's not exactly its product. I hit these conditions about symmetry. Uh, so they, well, you have to symmetrize it. But in any case, there is, if you have a compatible measure here and a compatible measure here, you can form a, a, a measure here that is here that is compatible with X plus Y, right? So there is some uh, algebraic thing there. Now, so in the remainder, I'll have this unitary representation on non-zero non, non fixed vectors. Now, the main issue will be, so now we have, we know what we want to talk about. We want to talk about these measures mu x. In the whole business, it's about comparing the mu x's. And what will get compared is, notice on the previous slide, this space here, if I have a representation, it will give me me a representation C of L0. It will give me the sequence of mu x's. In particular, it will give me mu x plus y. Yes, it will give me this measure, mu x plus y. But it will also give me the measure mu x and mu y, of which I can form this measure. And so, but this and this, they live on the same space, right? This one lives here, therefore here. And the other one, this one here, straight lives on that space. So I can compare these two, and this will be the main point. So comparison of this measure and that measure as, the, as, uh, as defined by C from my theorem, yeah? 
So both are compatible measures on that space. And I want to say orthogonal, not orthogonal, what's going on with them. Okay, so now the first, uh, the first theorem here, so it was formulated in a different language. So this language that I, it's just, I, I just uh, defined was not present in, in the paper, but this is a translation of what he proved. So my student, uh, Mahmoud Atadadi Aliabadi, proved that if I have a unitary representation of a zero without non-zero fixed points, so no zero, no non-zero vectors that are fixed, then what happens is this. What one can do, I told him, okay, so look, just look at the representation like this. Take phi there. Look at xi of phi. That's a unitary. One can assume that del Hunkole, one can still compute the powers and compute the maximum spectral types. These are, these are things computable, not just for automorphism, but for unitary uh, operators. Take those and simply assume that for generic phi, the del Hunkole Meinchen condition holds, that this orthogonality condition from del Hunkole Meinchen just holds for, for this abstract representation. There is no Boolean action, no nothing, no T's, no odd. Just assume that this holds, this, this, one can just rewrite the formula. What does this mean for that representation, C, in terms of these measures from my theorem, this mu x, mu y? And what he proved, he, he gave a precise translation. But this is a, 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 so a special case of his theorem. He proved that then there is orthogonality here. If you have that for a generic phi, then for my measures, for the representation, these two measures will not compare with each other. They will be orthogonal to each other for all x, y. So you have this orthogonality no, for all x, y, no matter what, uh, what x and all y, what y you pick. Yeah? So orthogonality translates into orthogonality. Yeah? But this is a nicer condition. Here you see it's kind of like a probabilistic condition, topologically speaking. It's for a generic phi, something holds. There is nothing like that here. It's just for that xi, if you compute these measures, this is what they will look like. They will be orthogonal to each other. Okay. So, okay. So that's what he proved. And now, so now the theorem that I want to, so this is the, this is the, the kind of the comparison between generic uh, spectral properties between gen, for generic aut automorphism of a measure and uh, uh, spectral properties of L0. Okay. So now, Theorem, so now uh, there is a connection first I want to make and then state the theorem and I'm done. So what are Koopman representations is standard, standard issue thing. You have, if I have a Boolean action of Z, zeta of G on, so homomorphism to odd, I can associate with every element of G a unitary transformation in over L2 of lambda, where lambda is odd, this is odd of lambda. How do you do it? You take F in L2, and you precompose it with the automorphism. How, is, how does UG act on F? You precompose F with the automorphism that you get from G when you apply zeta. You have to take minus one so that uh, it's actually homomorphism. So that's, these are the Koopman representations. They're special representations of G, not arbitrary, coming from actions on uh, Boolean actions, coming from Boolean actions. Okay, so now once you have that, so what is the connection? So the proposition, there is a proposition here that uses uh, Eteladi Aliabadi's theorem and uses the Hunkole Meinschick and there is this Fubini-like argument here. And it says that if you assume that for a non meager T, this is isomorphic to L0, then there exists, there is one ergodic Boolean action of L0 whose Koopman representation behaves like at the Dadi Aliabadi's conclusion, that these things are orthogonal to each other. So this is perhaps not so, so strange. You have many T's, say commingerly many, most T's are, uh, this is L0, this is L0. For most T's, del Hunkole Meinschick orthogonality holds, this is from the theorem of del Hunkole Meinschick. Therefore, you might expect there will be an action of L0 such that for generic element of L0, not of, of odd now, but of L0, this del Hunkole Meinschick condition will hold. But then you just apply at the Dadi Aliabadi's theorem and you get that condition. So this is perhaps to be expected. There is some descriptive set theory to be done, a Fubini argument, Fubini like argument, 
needed here. And I have, I have now one representation, one Boolean action, ergodic Boolean action of a zero that looks strange. This is this strange condition. And then, okay, then, then, and then you prove the theorem. That's, the, that's where the bulk of work is actually, and I won't go into it. That if I have the Koopman representation associated with an ergodic Boolean action of a zero, not only these measures are not orthogonal to each other, they are actually always, this measure, this product is always absolute continue, absolutely continuous with respect to the measure uh, that the representation gives me for X plus Y. So uh, if I have a Koopman representation, so coming from a Boolean action of L0, I have this absolute continuity condition always, no matter what. Actually, this is not a full theorem. There's, this is more general than that, but this, is, this suffices for the talk. So I, I have this absolute, con absolute continuity condition, yes? So if Koopman representation, for arbitrary representations of L0, there is no condition like this, that they behave freely. But for Koopman, this is what you always get. This absolute continuous. So these two measures always compare. And then once you contrast the two, you are done. So I had that for all from my th this last theorem here, there is absolute continuity condition. Uh, on the other hand, there is one ergodic action for which orthogonality condition holds. Now, if I say, okay, I have one that is like that, for all of them I have like that, a situation like that, then for that one I have this and I have that. If you just think for a second, this means that all the mu x's are actually zero. Mm -hmm. And if all the mu x's are zero, this action couldn't have been ergodic. It's a trivial action. So they, then we reach a contradiction and we see that, uh, uh, that uh, we could not have a non meager set of t's such as tc as isomorphic to L0. That's where uh, things went wrong. Okay, let me, let me perhaps finish here. Thanks. Uh, any questions uh, to Swavek? Well, equivalence relation. Yes. Is it even known if there, uh, is there another candidate for possibly? No, okay. Uh... So this is exactly, yes. So that's the perfect question here. The one, one wants to see if the question is, is there a single G such that this, and there is no candidate for that. There is no, L0 was the only one and it's, <laughs> it's wrong. So there is no candidate like this. So, uh, I, my personal suspicion is that actually there is no group like this. In fact, there is no generic class. So all, all equivalence classes with respect to this equivalence relation are actually meager. So you will have, all the, you will have many groups, continually many groups, so that these equivalent, within each equivalence class, every T gives you that group. And they will be very similar to each other, very similar to L0 but they will, be, they will not be isomorphic. To say that there are T's for, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mention, but there are T's for which this is L0. There are situations that L0 shows up actually. So it's not also shows up, but that's my, that will be the situation in my. And, and is there a set of properties of L0 that uh, instead of asking that you are isomorphic to L0, yeah. you only consider these properties and you can still ask if uh, generically uh, this hold for the- Oh, uh, this, this was this all this, this whole work was a bit like that. I mean, this, this preceding work. So essentially what you came up, except for the spectral properties, essentially anything that you would guess, you would guess, you would look at L0, you guess some property, you would normally be able to prove that this is, this is a generic thing. It's true, but that's it for a generic T, TC has that property. There is one, okay, you are asking very good questions. <laughs> so <laughs> there is one, there is a question of Glasner and Weiss. So the, all these questions are quite old. This question that I, that we talked about here is probably 15, maybe 20 years old. This is a little younger, maybe 10 years old, but still wide open. They ask for whether for a generic T, this group has what they call Levy property which means there is a sequence of compact groups, increasing sequence of compact groups whose union is dense. And these compact groups with respect to the hard measures on them exhibit what they call a concentration of measure property. And this is not known. L0 has that property. That, and so, okay, I'm being recorded, but uh, so I would say, you know, I, there is a hope, there is a hope that this has, this is, the answer is yes here. And this would actually go, can go both ways because this may, uh, you might say, okay, so you are still proving that you are similar to L0, but this could possibly be used 
you answer yes to that. And this gives you a way that these groups, all these groups are so similar to L0 that you will be able to run the same argument that we ran here for L0 in order to prove that that particular group is not generic. So you, say, you would hope that, that you would be able to run the same argument, but making it so similar to L0 that it, that, that, that not. You chose, so you saw no, no particular group of this form, P, like PT for the PT group, no particular uh, C0 of C cannot be a generic group. Correct. No, yes, that's right. So you would just replace your L0 with this T0C. Yes, T0C. But you would, you would probably need some abstract properties. That, and this Levy property would be good. These Levy sequences are kind of more canonical. Uh -huh. These groups, it's known that there are sequences, for example, of compact toruses, increasing sequences of higher and higher dimensional toruses whose union is dense. It's not clear, highly not clear that they have concentration of measure. But if you prove that they have concentration of measure, then they are they are become kind of more canonical. And the first step would be to prove this first theorem that I mentioned about uh, what representations of L0 look like using maybe these Levy sequences. And there is a theorem that I had some time ago that uh, you see this group is also in very, in another way, similar to L0. L0 behaves like it has a tangent space. It has a, this is a Polish space, Polish linear space of measurable functions with values in R. There's an exponential map here that is onto, which is a co continuous surjective homomorphism. For these groups, the same thing happens, except here you don't have L0, but a closed linear subspace of L0 and the continuous homomorphism. So you would, you would probably try to use this kind of uh, uh, structural property that is already known about these TCs match it with, uh, with uh, this Levy sequence, this uh, concentration of measure sequence, and try to run the whole, this whole, whole, whole argument again. But many things would have to work out. I mean, there's many holes now, but there is a scenario. All right. Thanks. Yes. And, and what, uh, so, so in your proof of the spectral theorem, mm -hmm. uh, what property, so you use this, do you use the Levy sequence of L0? Oh, no, 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 this, uh -huh, okay, very good, perfect question. So you use, you use this map. So in this proof, this, uh, this, this, uh, this first theorem, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, this, you use this map and you actually work with that space here. Uh -huh. So this here, you would replace it working with this LT perhaps. But this, this proof may also be, it's possible that this proof is not maybe the right one, because you would think that you would actually try to, you have this increasing sequence of toruses that are, the sequence is more or less canonical, and you, you try to study the representation of the, of L0, okay, if you have representation of L0, you have the representation of the toruses on the way, mm -hmm. finite dimensional toruses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They would have to cohere somehow, and you try to get from you know, your knowledge of representations of toruses, take a limit and get this spectral theorem that you just proved for L0. That's not how the proof goes. Right, it okay. uses some functional analysis. So here you would have to change this proof, use this LT, use the toruses, and then use, use LT to guarantee. So all, for the toruses, you have full knowledge of the representation on the toruses, and you would use the existence of LT to prove that there is a limit uh -huh. of, of, of these representations. They cohere, and there is a limit. Therefore, you have, you have a representation of, of, that group, mm -hmm. of, of, of that group that you, you are studying. Yeah. So okay, it's all kind of vague, but. But it's not even worked out for L0 uh, itself, that type of proof. Like take, no, take exactly. a sequence, no. sequence yes, there. Yes, and yes, yes. Like a... no. Yes, that would be maybe the first step, the simplest step. Okay, so yeah. so so this is something that it's a good problem for a student, say. Yeah, I think so. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not kidding. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions for Swami on the Zoom? Uh, I don't think Guillermo. Uh, are there any questions? Maybe no. in the chat. No. Um, oh, well, okay. Uh, let's, then let's thank Swavik again for an awesome talk. Thank you.